Today we're going to be looking at the Word Study KJV Reference Bible by Thomas Nelson Publishers. And speaking of Word Study, if you are all about Hebrew or Greek nerdiness, and you like being warm, which right now in the middle of this crazy cold spell, who doesn't, then bundle up like I am in one of our cozy Disciple Dojo hoodies. Now, in addition to cozy sweatshirts, another great way to stay warm during the winter is with a nice hot tea or coffee. And they taste even better when you drink them out of one of our Disciple Dojo Old Testament timeline mugs. Yeah, you can sip your coffee and learn all about the United Monarchy and the Divided Monarchy and the Exile and the Second Temple Period. What more could you ask for? So if you're looking for fun gift ideas, anything you buy over there not only makes a great gift for your favorite Bible nerd, but also helps get the word out about Disciple Dojo as you wear it around or drink your coffee in the break room. But another way to help get the word out about Disciple Dojo is to subscribe. In fact, that's the biggest way. If you subscribe and you click the notifications icon, that is so huge in helping continue to grow this channel. We just passed 16,000 subscribers uh, about a week ago. When we get to 20,000, that's our next goal. When we hit 20,000, I'm going to give away a ton of study Bibles, including this one that we're going to look at in this episode. But the only way you'll be able to know about and be entered to win any of those is by being a Disciple Dojo subscriber. So do that if you haven't already. All right, let's talk about this Word Study Reference Bible. Now, the Word Study Reference Bible is available in the KJV, which is what this is, and the NKJV. The NKJV, I think it has a blue cover. KJV has the red. They're both available in a number of different leather type bindings, as well as hardback, which is what I'm holding. Comes with this nice, very redundant dust jacket and looks the same without it. Now, the Word Study Reference Bible is 1,838 pages with 12 full color maps in the back. It's double columned and it is red letter edition. So let's take a look at it. Now, right here on the front, it says 2000 keywords that unlock the meaning of the Bible. I think that's a bit of an oversell. I don't think not knowing keywords in their original Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic keeps the meaning of the Bible locked, but they are key words in the sense that they're important words, that concepts in scripture in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, they are important because the Bible was not written in English, not even King James English. So that's what this study Bible is intended to address. So you open it up, obligatory dedication page, table of contents, book abbreviations, and then you come to an introduction. And this will give you an idea of where it's coming from. So this study Bible contains 2,000 straightforward, readable Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek word studies to help you delve more deeply into what God had in mind when he inspired the scriptures. No previous knowledge of languages is required. Every chapter of the Bible includes at least one word study. Many have more than one for you to enjoy as you read God's word. The KJB Word Study Reference Bible is the perfect way to sample the benefits of the more vivid understanding you get when doing original language Bible word studies. That's a much better way to say it than unlocking the hidden meaning or whatever. That is what a doing a word study should do. It should help brighten to give you a more vivid understanding. It should bring things out that you may not have noticed. And in addition to these word studies, you're also going to find 21 topics that explore major teachings and big takeaways from the Bible. Each topic is explored through short, accessible articles that appear throughout the text. And so these are the types of topics that you're going to find. So on the Trinity, there's going to be five notes and they'll tell you what pages they're found on, which parts of the Bible. Same thing with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, other concepts that are important, love, covenant, Bible, salvation, Christ follower, church, sanctification, obedience, purpose, people, God's will, relationships, evil, sin and temptation, suffering, faith and works, and last things. And these will be marked out in the text with these red and gray boxes. And it'll tell you, this is note one on the topic of evil. And then at the end of each one, it'll give you the next. So note two is going to be found at Psalm 37. So you flip to Psalm 37 and there's note two. And then at the bottom of that, it'll say the previous note back at Genesis or the next note, and it'll be at Matthew 25. And then in addition to those topical articles, there are also going to be articles that tell you how to study the book. So whatever book you're reading, there will be a, a section called study the book, and it'll give you background or insight that help you as you're reading through that book. 
And just like with the topical articles, you'll have a note about something that's important in Deuteronomy, and then it'll say next. So this is Deuteronomy 6, it'll say next, Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. So you turn Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8, there's the next study the book note. The next one, Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. So you turn to that one, read it. Then the next one, Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 22. There it is. Then Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. And Deuteronomy 31. And that is the final note for Deuteronomy. So those are ways that you can jump through the Bible and trace a whole theme, as well as doing that for each book in the Bible. Then there's a section in the introduction on why word studies are helpful. And I'm going to read this because I think this is really good. It says, even if you're using a reliable, accurate translation, such as the NKJV, so I'm guessing this was the preface that the NKJV used and they just didn't change that to KJV. Either way, same thing. There's only so much any English Bible can communicate. That's because there is not an exact one-to-one -one correspondent between languages. For example, one ancient word might have several English words that convey its meaning, depending on the context and the intention of the writer. The reverse might also be true. In some cases, several ancient words could be the original for one English word. Those ancient words have a variety of meaning that would not be apparent to someone reading an English Bible unless they knew just which ancient word was being used and why. Word studies give you an opportunity to understand God's word closer to the way the believers did who first received these inspired books from those who penned them. You'll find you're obtaining insights you never had before. And then at the end, it goes on to say, the KJV Word Study Reference Bible is designed to be a handy, readable, and enjoyable introduction to Bible word study. Even though it includes 2,000 selected word studies, that's just a fraction of all the words used throughout the Bible. The Bible is translated from more than 8,600 distinct Hebrew and Aramaic words and more than 5,600 Greek words. So what you have here is a taste of, that will probably whet your appetite for more. And then they point you to a couple resources. When you're ready for a more exhaustive treatment of biblical words, there are several other publications you might find useful, including Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible and Mounts' Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words. So I like that they said this. They're letting you know up front that you're going to get a deeper appreciation for some concepts that you may not have been familiar with just because you simply don't know the language. And that's true. And they're saying that this is just a taste. This is not exhaustive. And I like that they acknowledge that, pointing the reader to go further if you want to. After that, there's a pronunciation guide. And this is important. If you don't know Greek or Hebrew, you may not know the differences between those languages. And there is more than one way to spell Hebrew and Greek words in English, depending on which system of transliteration you're using. Vowels, for instance, are particularly difficult because Hebrew has nearly two dozen vowels, where English has five. And then some of the letters in Hebrew you don't actually pronounce to make it even more complicated. Now, you learn this your very first class in biblical Greek or biblical Hebrew. But most people don't ever take a class in biblical Greek or biblical Hebrew. And so this is sort of giving you some of that information up front. And there's a lot more that could be said on this. But they're just trying to tell you, this is how we are spelling these words. And it's because throughout the text, they don't actually use the Hebrew or the Greek fonts. They only use transliterated words. And so if you look at a commentary, that commentary may have it transliterated, but it looks different than how this Bible has it transliterated because this Bible is using a simplified, popular, non-academic form of transliteration. So just be aware of that. Then there's the list of the articles that we looked at. And then after that, this was peculiar to me. They included this dedication to the King James translation, but just the beginning part of it. They didn't actually include the whole preface to the King James that the King James translators put together that tells you about why the King James was translated the way it is, how they handled Old Testament, New Testament, what they sought to do, why that they themselves acknowledged that the King James was not the perfect Bible, which is funny, even the translators of King James were not KJV only -ists. But none of that's included in this. They just give you the dedication to King James. And if you've never read that dedication, it's got some pretty interesting 
interesting language in it. You know, to the most high and mighty prince, James, by the grace of God, king of Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, etc. The translators of the Bible wish grace, mercy, and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Very Pauline introduction. But I want to point this out because this is one of the reasons why the King James Bible I don't recommend as people's primary translation. And it's not because it was bad at the time. It's because it uses different English than the English we speak today. And here's an example right at the front. Great and manifold were the blessings, most dread sovereign, which Almighty God, the Father of all mercies, I don't know what that C is supposed to be, bestowed upon us the people of England when first he sent your majesty's royal person to rule and reign over us. This is a great example. Dread in this does not mean what dread means today in English. This is the older meaning of dread. This is not like the dread pirate Roberts and the princess bride. Like dread means bad, terrible, terrifying. That's not what they were intending to convey when they wrote this. And it goes on. There's a lot more like royal language, which is just interesting. It's infused with biblical language and they really lay it on thick. Nay, to go forward with the confidence and resolution of a man in maintaining the truth of Christ and propagating it far and near is that which hath so bound and firmly knit the hearts of all your majesty's loyal and religious people unto you that your very name is precious among them. Their eye doth behold you with comfort and they bless you in their hearts as that sanctified person who under God is the immediate author of their true happiness. And then they get on with the dedication and they finally say, the Lord of heaven and earth bless your majesty with many and happy days that as his heavenly hand hath enriched your highness with many singular and extraordinary graces. So you may be the wonder of the world in this latter age for happiness and true felicity. So that was the normal way when King James English was spoken to address your king your ruler. But you can see a difference in the language from how we would speak today. And there are a lot of terms in there. I mean, I just pointed out dread is one of them, but others like calumniations and felicity. These are words that have either slipped out of usage for the most part or are become super obscure. But they are no longer today the types of words that normal people use in their everyday discourse. And most of scripture is written in the types of words that normal people at the time used in their everyday discourse. So the King James, that when people, I mean, I have King James only trolls that comment on my channel. I'm probably going to get a bunch that comment on this video, but they'll comment things like King James is the only inspired word. It's the only true word of God. It's the only, it's not the language we speak. And it was a great translation when it was the language people spoke. But there's no more reason to have the King James as your translation than to have something in the English of the period of Chaucer, or going all the way back to the time of Beowulf. Those forms of the English language are almost unrecognizable today. And the further time goes on, the more foreign the English of King James's era becomes. There's also a danger when you're using King James, and, and I, listen, I'm not anti-King James. If you want to use the King James and you have a good working knowledge of Elizabethan English, go for it. If you love looking up words in the Oxford English Dictionary, go for it. But if you don't have a good command of Elizabethan English and you don't know arcane word forms, then you could very easily misread the King James. And our friend Mark Ward over on his YouTube channel has a whole series called False Friends that talks about this. False Friends are words that when they were written in the King James Bible meant one thing, but now in modern English, those words mean something entirely different. Dread is a great example, but there are many, many, many others. And if you don't know that, then as you're reading it, you may think, oh, I know what this word means. And you may interpret the passage based on what you think the word means in a modern English setting. But that's not what the translators in the time of King James were attempting to communicate. And so what you do is you end up misreading a passage based on what you think is a word that you know the definition of, which is why 
They're called false friends. I'll link in the video description below to the playlist over on Mark's channel. Go take a look. Mark has done probably more than anybody out there in helping to wean people off of the cult-like devotion to the King James as the only inspired text. That's just a, a it's, at the end of the day, it's a nonsensical approach. It's unhealthy, it's unbiblical, it's divisive, and it's just bad biblical interpretation. Mark's much more gracious than I am because he used to be someone who's King James only. And he's talked about that both in his book about King James onlyism and in his numerous videos. So check out Mark's channel. He's a friend of our channel. Love what he's doing. Good dude. So anyway, if you're going to be reading the King James Bible, having this version is actually pretty helpful because it at least puts you back into the words that the King James translators were working with with. So as you go through this Bible, each book has a quick introduction. And at the beginning, it gives you the study the book highlights. I'll zoom in here a little so you can see. So it'll tell you which chapters those study the book passages are going to be found in. Then there's going to be a summary of the book, very basic. In this case, it's like a page and a quarter. And then you begin the text. Now, Genesis 1-1 is as good as any to give you a good idea of what you're going to find in here. I'll zoom in a little close here. So you're going to see certain words underlined. So in the beginning, God created and then the heaven and the earth. So created heaven and earth are underlined. And then the earth was, is underlined, and without form is underlined, and void, and darkness is underlined, was upon the face of the deep. So as you're reading through the text, here's how this works. First of all, there's a study note, and this is just one of those topical study notes. This is one of those on God the Holy Spirit. This is note one on that topic, and it'll tell you that the next note is going to be found in the book of Numbers. But about the actual word study, if a word is underlined, then in that chapter, there's going to be a word study on one of the underlined words. In this case, it's this word create, bara. So it'll say Hebrew bara, and then it'll give you a couple of passages where it's used. Genesis 127, 6, 7, Isaiah 45, 18, 65, 17. These aren't all the places it's used, just a few. And then it'll give you a short little article about what this term, in this case, bara, what bara actually means, how bara is used elsewhere in scripture, just to give you a little bit more meaning behind this what is in English, the word create. So the goal is to keep you from importing into the meaning of the word create in the biblical text of Genesis 1-1, all of what the English word create may mean, and to keep you focused on what the Hebrew word bara actually does mean. Then inside that same box, you'll see all these other words, heaven, earth, was, without form, darkness, sky, good. These are all of the other words on this page that are underlined. And it's telling you that there are word studies for each of these words elsewhere in the Bible. So if you want to know about heaven, you're going to have to flip over to Genesis 1-9. And Genesis 1-9, here is that word study on heaven. And it gives you the different meanings of heaven and how it's translated sometimes as sky, sometimes as atmosphere, sometimes as the physical heavens, where the planets are. It gives you the range of meaning. And then at the bottom of this box, there are these other words that are in this chapter that have word studies found elsewhere. And then as you're reading along, you take note of those thematic articles like here's one on the Trinity. And so they say when God initiated the creation of people, he hinted at his Trinitarian identity, saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Instead of in speaking in the singular form, God used the plural us and our to refer to himself. This idea of plurality within the one God is reinforced by the Hebrew word used for God's name in Genesis 1. Despite the fact that the people of Israel were monotheist, meaning they believed there was only one God, they used the plural Elohim rather than the singular L to name God. Christian theologians see these linguistic oddities as clues to the fact that God is triune, one God in three persons. And then the note continues on to unpack the doctrine of the Trinity, and it gives you a note if you want to know more about the Trinity, flip to Deuteronomy 6, 
4. Now, not all Christians, by the way, read Genesis 1-1 as speaking of the Trinity. They do not think that Elohim being plural in form has anything to do with a plurality within the Godhead. Some just think it is God using the divine we, what's been called a plural of majesty. When you're speaking in an elevated or an official capacity, you sometimes say we instead of I. Some have said that's what's going on, and other Christian interpreters have said, no, God's speaking to the divine council. He's speaking to the heavenly hosts, the angels. So this is only giving you one view, and you could easily be misled into thinking that that's what this word actually means. So you have to be careful. If you don't know Greek or Hebrew, be very careful when appealing to Greek and Hebrew. Unfortunately, it's not just TikTokers who are guilty of this. Even preachers do this periodically. We have a video here on the channel where Professor He-Man over behind my shoulder here talks all about some of these word study fallacies that pop up even in good preaching from time to time that are just wrong and that we need to be aware of them and we need to handle the languages with care. I'll link that video below. Check it out if you haven't already. It's my favorite of all the superhero seminary videos we've done here on the channel. Those of you that comment that I am surrounded by idols all the time, you may not like it because it does have action figures in it. And that's triggering for a lot of people in the comment section on my videos, apparently. But for the rest of you that have healthy functioning senses of humor, check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. But this is literally all you're going to find. So there's not really any study notes for me to review like I typically do. You know, the notes in Genesis, there's there's not really anything about it. Issues like the age of the earth, the extent of the flood, where the day is literal or not. They stick to giving these word studies, for the most part, and broad theological notes. The book introductions, they're short, they're simple, they don't get into a ton of details. I mean, when you come to Exodus, for instance, they do have a note at the top that says Exodus compiled and written by Moses himself. So they do hold to Mosaic authorship, but there's really nothing in the introduction about the date of the Exodus, the identity of the Pharaoh, the location of the Red Sea or Mount Sinai, or any of those things that we look at in some of our study Bible reviews. And speaking of Exodus, I was interested to see if they would make any mention of the numbers of people involved in the Exodus. Some of the notes do talk about Moses leading out 600,000 men and their families. And so I wanted to see if they do a word study on the word thousand, LF, which is a significant factor in how you read the Exodus. Does that mean thousand or should it be translated as something like regiment since it does have that meaning elsewhere in scripture? And there wasn't a note on LF in the book of Exodus. And there wasn't even one on numbers. I flipped the numbers to see if it would be there and there wasn't one there. But that's when I turned in the back to the English word index and I flipped to the word thousand. And there it is right there. Thousand. First Samuel 29, five, the Strong's number H0505. And so I flipped to first Samuel 29, five, and there is the word study for thousand LF. And there's what it says. Hebrew, Aleph, Psalm 5010, Micah 6, 7, Strong's number 80505. This noun represents the number 1000. While it may denote a literal number, Judges 2010, or possibly a round number, it is more often seen as a symbolic number indicating a very large quantity. Deuteronomy 5, 9 and 10, 2 Samuel 18, 12, Psalm 94, 2 Peter 3, 8. Now, it's weird that they put 2 Peter 3, 8 in a word study about the Hebrew word Eleph because Second Peter was written in Greek. But it goes on to say, this word may also indicate a social grouping smaller than a tribe, but larger than a father's house. That is a group roughly equivalent to an extended family. Judges 6.15, 1 Samuel 10.19. For centuries, scholars have hotly debated the significance of the term thousand in the censuses in Numbers 1 and 26, as well as the Bible's only explicit mentions of the millennium, Revelation 20, 1 through 6. Now, if you didn't know to go looking for that, if you're just reading through Exodus and Numbers and you're reading about these, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and you're like, wait a minute, how are they the smallest of all the nations? And the way the Bible describes Israel as helpless and small, but if there are 
two million of them. You'd have to do some digging to find this out. But that's the benefit of having this index in the back. So all 2,000 of the words that they have chosen to do word studies on, the English words, the words that the King James uses, and the underlying Greek or Hebrew words, they're listed in alphabetical order. And then after that, the same list is listed by Strong's index number. So all of the Hebrew words are listed by their Strong's number, and then all of the Greek words are listed by their Strong's number. Now, I'll confess I don't use Strong's Concordance. I never really have because by the time I was ready to start doing that level of biblical study, I was already learning Greek and Hebrew. And if you know Greek or Hebrew, or at least you know how to read Greek or Hebrew and look up words in a lexicon, you don't really need the Strong's number anymore. But for those who don't have Greek or Hebrew, Strong's numbering system is the way that you locate and differentiate specific Greek and Hebrew words. So this helps you use this Bible in conjunction with Strong's Concordance. Likewise with Romans, you get a very broad overview. Well, they did include this note that I do like and I wanted to highlight. As you read Romans, realize that the first 11 chapters are a carefully constructed presentation of the gospel with every chapter building upon the previous one. Certainly Christians have used many of the verses of Romans in personal evangelism, and they give you the verses of the famous Romans Road. But keep in mind that each of these verses has a context. As you read Romans, strengthen your use of these verses by noticing how they fit within the progression of Paul's theology throughout the book. Now, I like seeing the study note. I think you should do that for every passage in the Bible. Every verse in the Bible has a context and should never be taken out of context. I don't even think verse numbers should have been added in the first place, but they were back in the 1500s. So what are you going to do? However, I like that they tell the reader, especially in Romans, because it matters so much in Romans that you see the flow of Paul's argument rather than just plucking verses out of the air. Now, when you come to Romans 7, they actually acknowledge the different ways that Christians have read Romans 7, but again, like with the Evangelical Study Bible, is disappointing. They only acknowledge two approaches. They say, some Christians interpret these verses as the struggles of a person before he or she comes to faith in Christ. However, other Christians think these verses refer to a person who has trusted Christ, but still struggles with sin. Those are certainly two ways that this passage has been read, but the oldest way that this passage has been read, going all the way back to the earliest Greek-speaking church fathers, was that Paul was taking all on the persona of someone else. And this I of Romans 7 is, is a rhetorical figure that Paul is having an interaction with. And for more on that, see the video that we've done here on the channel that does a deep dive into this section. However, it is nice that they acknowledged different ways of reading this passage, and they don't take a hard stance on which of those two are correct. Now, just like with Romans, the Revelation overview, very simple. It's just like a page and a quarter. I'm going to say this is a good introduction to Revelation. It, it doesn't get near into the amount of detail that you need to do a study of Revelation, but what it does give you is good. It lists the different approaches, preterist, historicist, futurist, idealist, and it even says it's possible to come combine them, and that's what would be the eclectic approach. It emphasizes that the purpose of Revelation was to bring hope, and it also lets you know that it is written as an apocalypse, so it uses symbolic language, and it speaks not just to future events, but to past, present, and future events. So I got to say, I liked the introduction to Revelation as short as it was. The study notes don't push any particular eschatological approach. You're not getting premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism. You're not getting dispensationalism. You're not really getting anything. You're just getting studies of the words and then some overviews of kind of what's happening in the book. But the focus of this Bible, again, it's not about study notes. It's about word studies. At the end, there is a concordance. It's not exhaustive. It's about 100 pages and obviously keyed to the King James text. And that's it. And then you come to the maps at the back. So that's literally it. That's all you have here. Now, there were some things that were curious there were some words that they didn't include in word studies. And obviously there are thousands and thousands of words, so they could not be exhaustive. But there were some words that it was puzzling why they chose one and not the other. Like they didn't do anything with the word azer. I think azer is a pretty important word, especially because it is what woman is described as in scripture by God. And it's usually just translated as helper or help meet, which is really not a good translation in English of what 
azer actually means. But they do include a word study on the form of the verb azar, which is to help or to give aid. And they have a word study on that. It's stuck away in 1 Samuel. So it was just odd that they chose to do a word study on the verb form, but they make no mention of the noun form of that word, which is a pretty significant term. If you want to see why I think that's a significant term, check out our video here on the channel where Professor Wonder Woman walks us through what an azer is in Hebrew. But obviously that's just an editorial decision that I don't want to nitpick. It was just weird that they would not include that, but they would include the verb form, which was much less significant. Now I'll show you an example in this where, because this is the King James, having this study Bible actually helps you understand something that you may not have understood because you don't speak King James English. In Luke 180, you come to this verse, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his shoeing unto Israel. Now, this is a word that we just don't use in English anymore. So you may wonder, what does shoeing mean? And am I even saying it right? Is this like the word so? S-E-W, where you say it so instead of sew, and this should be his showing unto Israel, which makes a lot of sense. But there's a word study right here that tells you what shoeing, shoeing, showing, it's from this Greek word, anadexis. And so it tells you what this word actually means, what someone's showing or showing or shoeing is. And that way you can understand what the passage is saying without having to try to decipher King James English. Now, interestingly, they didn't do waxed. This is a great example of a false friend. Most people think they know what waxing means, but this doesn't have anything to do with body hair removal or making a car shine. This is a much older term for increasing. And I think the only time we ever even use it in modern English is when we're talking about phases of the moon. So if you happen to know what a waxing gibbous moon is, then you might be able to make sense of this. But if you're just an average reader and you're coming like, what, who, what was Jesus waxing? So this might've been a place where they could have used a word study to help the average reader. So would I recommend the Word Study KJV Reference Bible or the NKJV Reference Bible? Honestly, if you got to have one, I think if you're going to have a King James Bible, this would be the addition to have because this will help you with some of the terms that King James translation uses, which because we don't speak King James English anymore are easily misunderstood. I like what they're trying to do. I like the idea of getting people back into the original text. My concern is that the word studies in this are too short. They don't give you enough of a range and because of that, it would be th this would be a resource that would be very easy to misuse, I think. If you use it to get, like they say in the introduction, a taste of what word studies are, and if you use this with other resources like Mounts' concordance that they mentioned at the beginning, I could see this being helpful. I also like the fact that there wasn't a strong theological bias in it. I mean, yeah, it is generally Baptist, you know, evangelical, conservative, Protestant, but the study notes and the word studies for the most part were pretty ecumenical. I looked to see if there was a complementarian or egalitarian leaning bias. I didn't really see one. I, you know, the famous passages that really become contentious in the whole women in ministry debate. There really wasn't anything touching on that subject in this study Bible. The notes didn't go one way or the other. Same thing when it comes to how they read creation or eschatology. You know, I, I just I didn't see a lot of the heavy handed theological bias in this that I saw in the last Thomas Nelson Bible I reviewed, which was the Evangelical Study Bible. So that was good to see. And if somebody was interested in word studies, I wouldn't dissuade them from using this. I will say, though, in the digital age, honestly, I don't know how necessary this is. If you go to Step Bible, Blue Letter Bible, eSword, those are all free and, and you they're all keyed to Strong's numbers and you can do some original language stuff on them. If you have the BART Bible app, you already have Strong's Concordance and you have it digitally linked to the original text. So that would be my only question is I would wonder how useful this would be in the digital age. But if you're somebody you're like, nope, I want to hold it in my hands. I want paper. I want to flip pages. I want to underline and circle stuff. Then I could see this being useful. It is only in King James and New King James. Those are 
two translations I really don't recommend making as your primary study translations. But if you wanted an edition of the Bible in King James or New King James, like I said, I think this would be as good as any to have. So those are my thoughts. There wasn't a ton of material to go through. I was able to review this fairly quickly. I didn't read through all 2000 word studies, obviously, but the ones that I did read through were, they were okay. They weren't terrible. My only caveat would be if you get the study Bible and you start getting into doing word studies, use with caution. It's very easy with a little bit of Hebrew or a little bit of Greek to come across as if you know more than you actually do. But as long as you're aware of that potential pitfall and you have access to other more in-depth word study resources, then I think this is a fine resource to use. So those are my thoughts. What are yours? If you've used this, chime in, let me know what you think. These reviews are entirely subjective. These are just my opinions. I'm not getting paid by any of the publishers to say anything either for or against any of the Bibles I review. Just telling you my honest thoughts. So feel free to share yours in the comment section below this video. But that's all for now. If you haven't already, we'd love for you to subscribe, click the notifications icon so you know when we have other study Bible reviews coming out, as well as our other teaching videos. The study Bible reviews get the most clicks on this channel, but they're really the most surface level of all that Disciple Dojo does. So if you only know about this channel for the study Bible reviews, check out our other playlists. Look at some of the Bible teaching that we have here on the channel. I think that's way more important than these reviews, but I also know that people find these reviews helpful, and so I'm happy to do them. That's all for now. We'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo. As always, keep training.